Good morning. I'm Kate Sedgwick, Director of Education and Events at the Victorian Law Foundation, and welcome to our better information session on peer-to-peer -peer education. So many of us are involved in developing and delivering CLE, and getting it right can be the difference between confidence and confusion for Victorians who need help. The success of the Hume Family Violence Peer Education Project demonstrates the effectiveness of peer-to-peer -peer education when it comes to working with community on challenging legal problems. This morning, we are delighted to be joined by Carolyn Webster, Manager of Dallas Neighbourhood House, Tanya McKenna, Policy and Education Manager at Northern Community Legal Centre, Umila Banavali, Peer Educator, and Lisa Albert from Fringe Dweller Films, who will each share how they contributed to the Hume Family Violence Peer Education Project. But first, it's my privilege to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country, wherever you may be joining us. VLF officers sit on Wurundjeri land, and today I'm on Wadarung land. We pay respects to their elders and to all the generations of Wurundjeri and Wadarung people and other First Nations people and acknowledge that the lands were never ceded. We recognise the impact of colonisation, its legacy of injustice and the marginalised marginalisation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And we believe that acknowledging the past is an essential step in building a better, more equitable future. Victoria Law Foundation aims to break down the barriers to justice for all Victorians through our work in research, grant and education. We are genuinely committed to making a contribution to a better justice system for all of us, especially those most vulnerable and in most need. Some housekeeping before I welcome Carolyn. Cameras and mics will remain off for all attendees. The chat function will be reserved for technical issues. There will be a question and answer session after the presentation. So please put your questions in there and you can upvote questions you would like the look of too, um, or would like us to ask too. We will be recording this webinar and you'll receive a link to the recording, PowerPoint slides and other resources mentioned shortly after we're done. Thanks, Kate. Um, I just thought I'd start off with a little bit about Dallas Neighbourhood House um, first. We've been established for about 30 years. Um, our original home was a three bedroom office of housing um, property in Dallas, which we quickly outgrew. Nowadays, we offer a range of adult education, uh, which is English language, digital literacy and vocational programs. Um, we also do social and recreational programs and have a very large um, emergency food relief program that caters for about 130 households um, a week. So now for, for the project, um, I started here at Dallas Neighbourhood House um, uh, about two years ago. Um, and one of the first things that I did was um, to start meeting with our partner organisations and learning a little bit more about the community itself. Um, we had, a, I guess, a cooperative relationship with the Northern Community Legal Centre in that they would use uh, one of our offices a week for an outreach program, but that had sort of gone by the way because of COVID. Um, so when it came to identifying the needs of the community, I met with uh, Jenny Smith, um, who's the CEO of the Northern Community Legal Centre, just to find a little bit more about what, what they do, um, who they service, what the needs are, that sort of thing. Um, and I sort of, the takeaway from that meeting with Jenny was that uh, the majority of the work that the legal centre do is around family violence. Um, and the stat that she told me that kind of really stuck with me was the fact that um, Hume has the second highest number of family violence incidents in metropolitan Melbourne. So I thought, well, there's something that perhaps Dallas Neighbourhood House um, needs to be looking at. Um, anyway, a few weeks later, I came across um, a funding grant stream that was only open to neighbourhood houses. So it was managed by our peak body and the funding came from the Sydney Meyer Foundation. 
So I thought, okay, um, that, you know, we're in with a good chance. It's only open to neighbourhood houses. The scope of what was being funded was quite broad and included um, things around gender equity and, and family violence. So I rang Jeannie, I said, hey, would you like to partner? Uh, let's do something together. So we met um, along with Tanya and came up with the idea of doing a peer education project. So that was, uh, we would take a bunch of Hume women, different ages, cultural backgrounds, um, through a series of education sessions and the end uh, product would be um, a video. So we thought, yep, that looks like a great project. Went away, started working on the, um, on the project, on the funding submission. Um, and as part of that, I made contact with Fringe Dweller Films, who I'd worked with in a previous role. Um, a lot of their work is around social justice issues. So I thought they would be um, a really good fit for our project. Um, so we got the grant, uh, we put an MOU in place. Dallas Neighbourhood House was to do the uh, project management. The Northern Community Legal Centre was going to do the education. So uh, once we had all that in place, we we're off and running. Uh, we started with an expression of interest process to recruit our peer educators. And we ended up running that twice so that we had a good pool of women to choose from. In our grant application, we said we'd like to have 10 peer educators involved in the project. Um, and at the end of that EOI process, we had about 30 women wanting to participate. So what I did, I, I rang them all individually just to find out what their motivations were, what their availability was. Um, and one thing that we're really mindful of is that we didn't want uh, this project to be a negative experience for anybody. So in terms of perhaps triggering past trauma, um, we, so that, that screening process um, was, was um, you know, essential to getting the right fit of participants. Um, so at the end of um, uh, going through that screening process, we had 13 women um, that we thought would be good for the project. By the time we came to start, we had 12. And of that 12, um, they were aged between 30 and 65 and came from eight different cultural backgrounds. Um, so I'll throw now to Tanya, who will talk about the next phase of the project, uh, which was the training component. Yep. Um, so Caroline mentioned the high rates of family violence in the city of Hume. And so they remain stubbornly high. So we're looking at around 4,000 incidents every year in our region where police are attending. Um, because of that, as an organisation, we've really tried to prioritise access to our services for victim survivors of family violence. So I think when I first started at Northern a few years ago, that was at around 40%, and then it went up to 50%. Uh, we're actually now tracking at about 68% of our clients who identify as victim survivors. So the way in which we've tried to really focus on increasing access, uh, we have dedicated family violence lawyers. So six out of our 10 lawyers are family violence related and they help women with a range of issues, including intervention orders, uh, child contact orders, advice about divorce proceedings, assisting with debt and fines, victim compensation, uh, and getting a name off a lease where that is required as well. We also recognise it's really important to have bilingual community development workers because that engagement with our local communities in the language that they understand is so important to facilitate access to legal services. We also provide duty lawyer services at the Broad Meadows Court for family violence intervention orders. And we participate in the early resolution service, which aims to negotiate and reach agreement on IVOs, including safety provisions prior to court proceedings. We conduct family violence <clears throat> and family law legal clinics, um, and we try and have those at places accessible to women. So uh, Caroline mentioned, we previously had outreach at the Dallas Neighbourhood House, that being one of those locations that women feel comfortable to go to. We also convened the Hume Family Violence Network meeting, and that's to ensure a coordinated response by the sector to family violence. 
And we also uh, have Week Without Violence Prevention activities that we coordinate across the sector. So that's coming up shortly in October. So moving on to the next slide. So I just wanted to link this in with key projects that we do at Northern. So one of those is the Safe Landing Project. So this project is really critical. It combines a wraparound support for women experiencing family violence who are on temporary visas. So in addition to all those other things I mentioned, that migration advice is really important to help women to access residency pathways, but also to have job rights and study rights so that they can support themselves independently. Um, the women coming through that program are often told that they'll, have, they'll be deported if they take action, that their kids will be removed, that they might be made homeless. So this is the really important work of debunking those myths around family violence and ensuring that women are aware of their rights. We also know that those women are arriving, they don't have family, but they don't have family support in this country. They're isolated, there's language barriers. They don't know about what the services are that are available to them. So that's the challenge. And that's where this project meets a really important need is how do we reach those really isolated women who are living with really extreme forms of family violence. Um, just a little note about that project. We have now had, this was a short-term project funded for one year. Uh, it has been extended for a further three years and Monash, uh, Southeast Monash uh, Legal Service is also implementing the same safe learning project. So we'll be working in partnership with them to ensure coverage across the Melbourne metro region. Just moving on to the next slide. So again, why this project is so important, I mentioned the Safe Landing Project, but before that we had a small pilot project called the Indian Women's Family Violence Project. And that was also targeting women who were newly arrived and on temporary visas and providing that around migration support. But we also collected quite a significant amount of data on those women's experiences as well. So you can see some quite startling statistics in this slide um, in that of those women on temporary visas, uh, physical violence was 93%, sexual violence, which we know is always underreported anyway, um, that was disclosed at 56%, uh, forced servitude 50%, injuries requiring medical treatment 39%, physical, physical abuse during pregnancy 28%, and attempted strangulation, 28%. So some very sobering figures that really highlight that we're talking about really high risk forms of family violence for women who are stuck in these situations. And so we recognize that these women, they may not be engaging with services, they may not know about their rights, but they will be chatting in language to other women that they meet, whether that's in a playground or at a doctor's office or at a specialist grocery, grocery store. So that's where peer-to-peer -peer education comes in. It's how we can support women to reach out to other women in their community and let them know about what supports are out there so we can try and impact against these um, quite disturbing statistics. So just moving to the next slide. So what did we actually do? So we participated in providing training to our peer educators. So you can see there the topics that we talked about, and this was a role I took on because I have a family violence training background. Um, some reflections just about that training. So when we started, we hoped it would be that we all met for lunch and had wonderful conversations and really came together as a group, but of course COVID hit. Um, it was the end of 2021. I can't remember what lockdown we were in, but we were all well and truly over lockdown. But it also was the challenge of we have to come together with a group of women, none of us who have met each other before, uh, multiple language groups, um, and tackling some really serious issues while we're working in isolation from our homes. Um, so that was a challenge. In a way, it was also a benefit. Um, I know I personally was feeling quite isolated from community at the time. And so these sessions provided a chance to really come together to talk as a group, to get to know each other. It was actually quite a highlight for me during my weeks of isolation. 
Um, we did have some communication issues with a couple of women whose English language skills needed some support. So we brought in one of our bilingual community development workers to assist uh, with that process. Um, the women became incredibly supportive of each other. There were disclosures within the group about experiences. The support that offered was really beautiful from the group and we spent a lot of time acknowledging each other's challenges and achievements. Uh, we also recognise that because we're talking about family violence during COVID, we had to make it fun as well. So we did games, we did uh, icebreakers, we talked about cooking, we talked about challenges with children. There was a range of other activ activities that went alongside the family violence training and we always made sure we finished the sessions on a high note. Um, the filmmakers, um, and I'll let Lisa talk more about this, but the filmmakers began to join us after the first couple of sessions of getting to know each other. They joined us at the end to talk about what we discussed in our session and to start to draw out some themes from the group. Um, they did this over multiple sessions and I think that engagement was so important because the women became to really like and trust our film producers as well. So that really impacted upon their capacity to engage in the project. Um, at the start of the project, when we talked about the film and potentially acting in the film, none of the women wanted to put their hand up. By the end of the program, everyone wanted to be involved. And I think that was a real credit to the relationships and the confidence that the women had. Um, so although my role was just in the training, I was so intrigued with the making of the video that I was also um, participating in that in a very, very minor way. Um, and occasionally just there to answer questions like, which services would women go to for information? Where would they find this information? The women had identified during these sessions that take the first step was the thing they wanted for the video. That step being to find out about your rights um, in Australia. So through that process, we talked about where would be a good place for women to access that information. And that's what's led to us developing supporting campaign materials. So if we could just move to the next slide. So we put some content on our website um, and recognising that this links so beautifully with our other projects, like our Safe Landing project, that it was something that was really quite a value add for us to include. We had that information translated into Arabic as well by our, our bilingual community development workers. And so that became a site which could be featured in the video when somebody is reaching out for assistance. We then thought, well, we also need a way of directing people to the website. And that's where the campaign materials in terms of posters and uh, social media tiles was developed as well. So this quite organically um, prompted a campaign uh, run by Northern Community Legal Centre called the Take the First Step campaign. And that was to distribute these posters as far and wide as we possibly could. So we have now got these posters up in police stations everywhere in our catchment. Uh, all of the offices of the Orange Draw have these posters. The maternal child health centres have these posters. They've also been distributed to libraries and local neighbourhood houses. So, and really trying to identify the grassroots locations where women might access this information. Uh, there's QR codes on the posters that take people to that page on the website. Um, and we are still working with peer educators about our peer educators about the distribution of these posters as well. So I'll just move forward to the next steps. So we have been able to keep on working with the group, which is fabulous. Um, through the Hume Council, we received an extra year of funding through their COVID recovery grant so that we could keep doing work with our peer educators. Um, probably about half the group is still involved. Many have gone on to other study and work opportunities, which is fabulous, fabulous for them. Um, we're also really grateful to the Victorian Law Foundation for a grant that's allowed us to extend this project into the Mitchell local government area. So that's around the Wallen to Seymour area. 
Um, this is really important because Mitchell also has really high rates of, of family violence and child protection notifications per capita. Um, so this is an area we've been really wanting to extend our presence further. And we've also received funding recently to do some work with the maternal child, child health agencies with a particular focus on the Mitchell area. So you can see how all of these things come together, which is so important, the access to legal services, the community engagement work, the bilingual peer educators to reach those women who are really isolated. And then hopefully all of that will generate women coming to support, to us for support and to find out further information about their legal rights. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Ermila, who is one of our wonderful peer educators who's going to do some reflections on her experience as well. Thank you. <coughs> Hello everyone, my name is Ermila, and as Caroline and Tanya is uh, saying, I'm one of the 12 women who participated the original project called Family Violence Peer Education Project. And this is my story why I got involved in it. Hearing and watching news about domestic violence is very common and it is very disturbing to all of us. The problem is growing as we speak. It hit me hard when it happened to someone I knew and I worked with. The person committed suicide in spite of having a good job owning her own dream house. She worked that day as usual and was going to start early the next day. That same evening, she ended her life. It was shock to all of us as we were absolutely no signs of distress. She was being emotionally abused and went on to suffer in silence until she could no longer take it. She chose to end her life instead. It made me think, what if she told me or anyone else what she was going through? That may, may could have saved her life. That was my motivation that if I could help one person from this tragedy, it would be worth the try. If ordinary people like us could do something instead of waiting for someone else or government to act, this problem could be eliminated. We all can help make a difference. Through this training program, we learn different types of abuse women go through. It could be physical, emotional, sexual, or even a controlling behavior. We learn the signs that someone is going through uh, this problem. We discussed how that person and the children are affected by it. We concluded that these women are staying in fear and don't know what to do. They don't even know that there is a help available and, and they are isolated and they do not have the courage to tell anyone. They are just hoping that the abuse will stop eventually. It is a false hope and not a safe environment for themselves and for their children. The video made <coughs> we made will show how the community library is the safest place for her and for her children to look for help on the internet, which could have been risky to do it at home without their husband or their partner finding it out. We all agreed working on this film together that we did not want to show any violence which could remind them of their past and will impact them negatively. Our message is simple. Take that first step to get help. And with that first step taken, there is a hope to change the situation and they can be happy again. The first step is to become a strong and face the situation with the help of all resources. We believe this video will help empower them to take the first step in helping themselves. We think that we are giving a simple but very powerful message which needs to be communicated in all communities in human city. This problem is not specific to any community, but faced by many. We are not going to stop at this video. We all want to work more toward this problem. We all can keep an eye in the community where we can suspect there is a problem and guide that help, helpless person. 
as a human being and a part of a community we all owe it i feel proud to be part of this group uh, my hope also is that we do not need to make videos like this because all the women are empowered and safe in future that's my story and i think i have uh, lisa will uh, take over from me thanks lisa thank you amila um i'm lisa and i'm a film producer at fringe dweller films my background is in anthropology community development and film producing uh, gendered violence and in particular family violence is something I'm also passionate about. I've done several film productions um, in this space and I hope to do many more. I was just going to give you a brief rundown on um, Fringe Dweller Films and what we do um, and how we have played a role in, in this project. Um, Fringe Dweller Films is run by myself and Vincent Lamberti. It's a small documentary production company. Most of our projects focus on centering voices that are rarely heard. These voices are often silenced or sit on the periphery of mainstream media and society. We do produce films for television broadcast, but we have a long history working alongside organizations to produce media projects like Take the First Step. Some of our past community productions have gone on to broadcast on ABC, NITV, and um, on SBS On Demand. Some have won awards at film festivals, and some have even screened at Parliament House. Topics include reintegration programs with prison inmates, public health messaging for communities directly affected by Melbourne's hard lockdowns, First Nations experiences of government policies like the Northern Territory intervention, um, other themes include identity and belonging, living with the impacts of substance misuse, understanding homelessness, decolonizing beauty, living with trauma and the impacts of family violence on children. Sometimes we also create resources for the services and we're currently working with the University of Melbourne to produce um, a practitioner resource guide on the care requirements of children who have lost a parent to intimate partner homicide. This particular work has um, been done over several years and is now has now developed into a feature length documentary we're currently producing uh, and pitching to broadcasters. This kind of work though is always interesting and, and we love this. Um, I'm amazed always at the courage and willingness of people to share their unique stories with the world. And it's a, it's a privilege to have this job and work with um, these issues. I do wanna keep this um, short and I'm happy to answer um, uh, any specifics around the project uh, at the Q&A, um, but I do wanna to briefly touch on our approach to collaborative filmmaking. Our approach has been refined over the years and obviously through these experiences, but essentially it comes from a belief that participants in the film should have agency over the process and the story. Films can be a powerful tool to incite action. And when it's produced by centering people's experiences and valuing them as the experts, a genuine collaboration happens. You, effort, you often get a story with more authenticity, and a sense of pride and ownership develops. And perhaps even some, some people are proud to share this project and become spokespeople or advocates for the organization that's facilitating the program. For us as filmmakers, this is what makes social impact filmmaking a success. Take the First Step is a social awareness video and an educational tool as you've, as you've heard from the previous speakers. But it's also a story about how 12 women allowed a legal and community service and a couple of filmmakers into their lives or Zoom sessions and how they entrusted us to listen and then go away and digest their advice to only come back with creative ideas in need of reworking until it felt right. The result is gentle and empowering. The lived experiences of women and children affected by family violence are emerging as key drivers to informing future policy and frameworks. And this video is a real life example of how it can be done. We hope you enjoy this video.
safe at home uh, it's it's my husband and I'm scared okay let's try this Thank you all. Um, before I commence um, looking at some questions um, from um, attendees, I just wanted to um, acknowledge you, um, Imila, um, for, and thank you for sharing your very personal story with us about what motivated you to become a peer educator. Um, we're grateful um, for you sharing that with us, and I'm sure we've all learnt um, a lot um, from you sharing that story, so thank you. We've had um, some questions come through um, through the Q&A and I would encourage you all um, to enter any other questions you may want to ask um, of our, uh, our speakers today there. Um, the first question um, is, uh, what does the week without violence look like? Uh, what sort of activities and, and services um, are run during that week? Um, I might take that one because we're coordinating some activities from Northern Community Legal Centre at the moment. Um, so the Week Without Violence takes place in the third week of October. So planning is well and truly underway at present because time is flying by. Um, we are bringing together a number of women's groups, so including our current peer educators with some other regional or some other local women's groups to have an event where we'll be doing awareness raising activities, but we're also inviting their families and friends to kind of like have that extended community involvement in the activities. Um, and there'll be some art based awareness raising activities, including painting t shirts with anti violence messaging, painting terracotta pots as well with symbols to that measure that represent um, an end to violence and having plants planted. But we'll also be showing the film. So looking for all those opportunities to keep using this film as a way of helping people to understand and feel empowered in the messaging that comes through the film. And so there'll be presentations. The um, materials that come out of that workshop will be displayed in our Broad Meadows local library as a public place. And we'll also be asking the library to show that video throughout the week as well. Um, and there we are just looking at doing a kind of another event actually within the library itself. So planning is still underway. Um, there are a range of activities being run by other organisations, which we're also supporting them with their activities as well. Um, thank you, Tanya. Another question um, 
it seems that a lot of uh, thought and consideration went into where to sh uh, to um, film the the video, um, and ultimately the, a library was chosen. Um, it would be really interesting to hear um, the thought process behind that um, and any insights you may be able to share about that. I'll, I'll jump in there, Kate, and start, start the answer to that. Um, I think we probably all remember uh, that was a very spontaneous comment towards the end. Um, probably the last session for memory um, before we were uh, commencing filming. So we had discussed locations and I guess the biggest, the biggest thing I remember talking about or the dilemma was um, how to represent um, this without uh, pigeonholing it or categorizing it so people um, could understand, or could, could connect with, with the content. Um, and I think I think that really speaks to how trusting people were um, through the process because that 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 idea came up right at the end where someone said actually not in the home or uh, not someone's home what about the library that's that's a safe place to be and everyone seemed to connect with that the um, the peer educators connected with that and 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 so we went um, ahead and and sourced a library to do that. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, we've had another question come through in the chat. Um, and uh, this uh, Mark would like to hear more about how the peer educators worked with their communities and how the video was used. Uh, was the video used by the peer educators uh, when they um, engaged with community members? Um, I'm happy to speak to this one. Or did you want to speak to this one? Uh, uh, can I answer this question? Uh, I have, uh, I being, uh, being a peer educator, one of them, I have uh, circulated this personally in my own group. I'm uh, from com Indian com uh, community background and there were lots of friends who needed to see that. And I have done my bit, not in a big, uh, big way, just the uh, individual families who have sent them to all my friends. And that's how I have tried to uh, send the message. If they were not affected, it could be somebody, their friends and all. That's how we are trying to get through the network and send this message strongly, slowly, but surely. Yeah, that's what I have done. And if I could just add to that, um, one of the things that we've all been doing since the video uh, was was uploaded is to share it with all of our networks and encourage our networks to share it with their networks and so on and so on. So I hope actually everybody um, attending this webinar today will also share it with their networks because um, we believe the film um, resonates with women from across Victoria, across Australia, not just the women of Hume. Thanks, Carolyn. I think you've answered another question that's come through from Ange about whether the uh, video is available um, beyond, you know, for communities outside of Hume. So, so thank you for that. Um, another question um, that I wanted to ask you all is um, you've spoken a lot about trust and building trust um, with the peer educators um, and, and, you know, together as a team <laughs> working on this project seems to be just such a, a critical element of, of ensuring the success of the project as a whole. Um, I'd be very interested to hear ab about, you know, um, techniques or things you put in place, uh, Tanya, Lisa and Carolyn, um, to, to really um, build trust with the peer educators. Just some examples of, of uh, things that, that were done in that regard. Do you want to go first, Tanya, given that you're in most of the education sessions? Yeah, sure. Um, so look, I think we the amount of time we spent for talking about things outside of family violence and getting to know each other on a personal level was a really important part of the project. Um, and I think 
the, I mean, I think the women really um, set the scene by being incredibly honest and open from the outset. Um, and then also being very incredibly supportive of each other throughout the course of the training as well. Um, it was a time where everyone was under challenges and stress. So people were trying to deal with children at home, children with COVID, childcare closed. There was a lot going on in that time. So I actually think there was a fair bit of camaraderie of coming together as women to support each other during those times as we tend to do in times of crisis. So that was my sense during the, during the sessions um, that the women managed to form some bonds that were really important. And I think I mentioned earlier on that ongoing engagement by the filmmakers coming in to each session at the end as well. If they had just come in at the end, it would not have worked. The fact that they came in and listened to the women and took on board what they said, generated that into an idea, came back, proposed their idea, workshopped that, refined it. Um, and so I would hope that I think the respect for the women's voices was really hopefully apparent to everyone involved that we were really, they were leading this project and we were there to support them as much as we could. Yeah, I, 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 would like to add, I would like to add that it was really informal and we were just like uh, friend, uh, friends all together, just chatting and uh, giving each other our experiences, exp exchanging our experiences and there was nobody to judge us. So it was really a free environment that we could literally trust each other and we didn't feel uh, anything to share our experiences. That was the main key. We trusted each other and didn't make fun of anybody or which is so very, and we all were passionate about this thing that something has to be done. That was the main thing that uh, put us together that we wanted to uh, see something coming out of this. And we are all still eager that there has so much, so much to be done. Yeah. I think um, just from the, as filmmakers coming into that process, I think um, we're very conscious when we come in, um, it, it, it might appear that we've got a lot of skills and expertise to create this, but we, we really come in with a different um, perspective and we come to um, experts <laughs> about something and we're there to learn and listen initially. And I think that helps build that trust. Um, I mean, we, I remember we were talking around, you know, what you can say, what you can't say, what, you know, even the dialogue, um, and that ultimately sort of ended up being spontaneous in the moment and what felt right in the moment once we were testing that out. Um, but I think we did, we did take on, we did hear questions like what, um, answers to questions like what what is family violence to you and what does it look like and how does it represent um, in the media and or or across you know social media platforms and we we went away and we 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 found some examples of that and came back and then workshop that again um, to hear what possibly was good about that and but what didn't work or what missed the mark or what perspective it came from um, and uh, it just kept that conversation going for the whole time of the process. You know, the whole process was about, um, yeah, reassessing and learning for us as well. Thank you. And we've probably got time for one more question. I can see that there's another question that's come through in the Q&A that we won't have time um, to get to today, but I will make sure that we get an answer to that person. Um, so to finish off, um, there's a question that's come through about whether there's been any positive engagement um, um, about this project from Victoria Police. Um. Uh, we, uh, through Amila, we had um, a member of Victoria Police come to the launch um, and has uh, sort of since gone on to say, if you ever need any sort of inroads into Victoria Police. So um, Amila was was able to bring their involvement in, you know, yeah. um, at, at that launch. Yeah. yeah. I can uh, say that uh, it was a good uh, uh, example for all women because it was a, a woman police officer from ethnic background. So I think that was very impressive for women to see that 
can happen and there is a hope for them. They could relate to somebody. All right, well, I think that brings us to time. Uh, so once again, Tanya, Lisa, Carolyn, Imila, thank you so much uh, for sharing with us today and, and for being part of our Better Information uh, webinar. Um, I've certainly learned so much, as I'm sure so many of our attendees have as well. Um, just a reminder to attendees that we will make the recording of this webinar available to you all. Um, along with some resources um, as well. Um, and if you do have any questions um, that you haven't asked through the Q&A, please don't hesitate um, to reach out to myself and my colleague, Helen, um, at the, the Victorian Law Foundation, and we'll, we will pass those questions on and, and make sure we, we get an answer for you. Um, but uh, thank you all once again, and I hope everyone has a good afternoon, despite the apparently gloomy weather. <laughs> Take care, everyone.